I was really struck by a couple of things about the parable that I had not noticed before. And the first thing I noticed about the parable about the mustard seed is about the mystery of the growth of mustard seed. How many of you, how many of you have actually seen a mustard seed before? Very small, right? Almost like the, the size of a, of a flea right? or something like that. It's very tiny. It grows into this shrub that's over 10 feet tall. Now, before I talk about this, just, just know that there are people out there that they try to use this parable of the mustard seed against our faith. When I was in seminary, we, we learned about a lot of atheistic scholars, and they said, you know, because of the parable mustard seed, we know that Jesus was not really God, because he was wrong. The mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. And it's kind of this ridiculousness. Have you ever heard that before? Just remember that, you know, people are allowed to exaggerate. It doesn't mean they're lying or that they're wrong. I'm sure you probably heard a bunch of people say this weekend, man, everybody in Crawfordsville goes to the strawberry festival. Would you call that person a liar, right? If one or two people didn't go to the strawberry festival? That's just one of the things you do. The mustard seed is extremely small. So it was a common example in the days of Jesus that people would use as something extremely small. Okay. But the first thing we need to recognize about the parable of the mustard seed is the, the mystery. Right? The mystery of growth. In our, in our modern scientific culture, sometimes we, we forget about the mysteries that surround us. And, you know, we, we think about how plants grow and about how the mustard seed grows into this huge plant. You know, we describe it with photosynthesis and we talk about, you know, the water and the sun, how it makes plants grow. And we act as if that just explains everything away. It's still extremely mysterious. How is it that the power of the sun and the water is able to bring about this huge growth in plants? It's a mystery. And that's what Jesus was saying when he talked to his, to his disciples. When the, when the farmer plants it, he, it all of a sudden it grows and he knows not. It's a mystery. When it comes to the spreading of our faith and the growth of our church... There's a mystery to it. It's still a mystery in world history that, you know, there's so many different religions and philosophies in the history of the world, and yet none ever spread as rapidly as Christianity did. I mean, think about it. It started with 12 uneducated men living in basically a forgotten area of the world. And within three centuries, basically the whole known world had converted to Christianity. It's amazing that power. And it's especially mysterious considering the fact that as the faith was spreading, the people spreading it were actually being persecuted. And they became martyrs and were put to death. And yet it spread all the more. The spreading of our faith is mysterious. And we need to recognize why the faith spreads. The only reason the faith spreads and the church grows is not from us. From the power of God. God gives the growth. Just as he gives the growth to every plant, every mustard seed. And I think, I think it's really important that we recognize this because I think sometimes we, we forget this in the church. As, as you and I both know that, you know, a lot of churches today, they're, they're basically dying. They're shrinking. And everybody's asking why. And, and I guarantee you, if you go to any of those churches, you'll probably still see a, a packed full schedule of, of meetings and committees and councils. And sometimes we need to recognize in the church that our faith doesn't really spread and grow by committees, by meetings, as important as they are. It spreads by the power of God. And we can have all the meetings and councils we want, but unless people are truly encountering God and asking for the power of God for the growth of our parish, the parish is never going to grow. The faith only spreads by the power of God. I'm, I'm reminded of when I was uh, when I entered seminary about 16 years ago, we had 30 seminarians, 30 seminarians in the diocese, and the vocation director was telling me when I entered seminary, he was telling me that when he was ordained 10 years earlier. There was only one seminary. So one person studying for the priesthood of the whole diocese. Ten years later, there was 30. 
And he told me the reason why there were so many seminarians is because, you know, a lot of people were asking the church because of the vocations crisis, you know, maybe we need to change the rules of the priesthood or something, maybe we need to do things differently. And there was this group up in Lafayette called the Sarah Club, and they started encouraging parishes and people in different parishes all throughout the diocese to do holy hours of prayer in front of the Eucharist exposed. And they started doing this week after week. And sure enough, as the years went by, the numbers kept growing, right, from 1 to 5 to 10 to 20. By the time I entered seminary, there was 30 seminarians. Because the people prayed in front of us, exactly. Vocations don't come from us. They don't come from meetings. They come by the grace of God. There's a reason why I'm so passionate about having Eucharistic Adoration every single week in our parish, every Wednesday, before every weekend Mass. I think every Catholic should be required to go to Eucharistic Adoration. How do we expect our faith to grow if we're not spending time with God? You know, another example of this, I know that I've talked about this before, but you know, it's just such a, a good example. You know, there's a, there's a church in our town uh, called Rock Point Church. And I always think about it because I, I talked to the pastor there who started the church, and it's always distracting the conversation. I know they're not perfect, right? They don't have the fullness of the faith or anything like that. But the story that they have is really amazing. When he got to the church 20 years ago, they had 20 members in the church. 20 members. And they didn't have any young children or young families, right, for the future. And now they're one of the biggest churches in Crawfordsville, maybe the biggest church. And I remember when I asked the pastor, you know, how they did that. He, he emphasized, he didn't talk about strategies and meetings and plans. He said, you know, Father, when we started this, there were so many churches in our town that were trying to be relevant to the culture. They were trying to make all sorts of compromises with the faith to be more accommodating. And we realized that if we wanted our church to grow, we had to be faithful to God. And for a Protestant, what does that mean? That means that they take the Bible seriously. They don't have a church to talk about different teachings, but they have the Bible. And so, you know, contrary to a lot of, you know, big Protestant churches out there, their sermons are very substantial. They don't avoid controversial issues. They don't try to be politically correct. They just try to be faithful to God. And he said, that's the reason why our church grew. Because we chose to be faithful to God instead of the culture. And I've always been struck by that. Very edified by that. They may not have the fullness of the truth. They may not have everything, but he got that right. We have to recognize where the faith, the power to spread the faith comes from. The other thing I was thinking about with the, the parable of the mustard seed is this, this idea of planting the seed. That if we plant the seed, God can give growth. We can never imagine the, the kind of effect that us planting seeds can have. And I was, I was thinking when I was, when I was younger, uh, the two people who had a tremendous influence on me when I was, when I was coming to age, they, they weren't even Catholic. I had this friend in 8th grade who, you know, was not particularly pious, and he invited me to go to this, this gathering of, uh, at, the, at the school, at the public middle school, on Wednesday nights, it was called Campus Life, and it was hosted by one of the Protestant churches in town, and I remember how that really started me on my journey. Then when I got in high school, I had another friend, again, not Catholic, who invited me to join a small group that he was born, and that was another huge step in my faith journey. Neither of those people were Catholic. In fact, I think pretty much both of them, after they graduated from high school, basically gave up the faith. They stopped believing in God. And yet, here I am, all these years later, from those tiny seeds that they planted in my life, and now here I am preaching to God as a priest. We'll never know the kind of impact that we can make just by planting those seeds. And I was also I was also reminded last week I was at this gathering of, of people who've done Curcio. Right? Curcio is a it's a four day retreat in the church. I don't know how many people have done Curcio here, but if you haven't done Curcio, I highly recommend it. Charles have done it. It's this awesome experience, four days retreat, spending that time kind of uh, kind of time with God. 
And I remember when I was in my parish in Noblesville five years ago, there was this guy named John. And he had been involved with Curcio for a very long time in English. And he had this desire about 15 years ago. He had this dream that he wanted our diocese to start hosting Curcio retreats in Spanish. Now, mind you, John doesn't speak any Spanish at all. He's like one of the whitest people you ever seen. <laughs> but he had this dream. He wanted to start Curcio in Spanish. And it took a very long time. It took like three or four years just to have the very first retreat. Because they had to find Hispanics who had done Curcio before in other countries. And ten years later, I went to this uh, gathering of people who had done Curcio in Spanish. And they announced that ten years of Curcio... Over 1,500 Hispanics have done Curcio in the diocese. And I guarantee you, if you go to any parish, any Spanish mass, any Hispanic community, the people who are most on, on fire and engaged with the faith, they've all done Curcio. It's had an unbelievable impact on our diocese. Because this white guy who didn't speak any Spanish had this dream. He wanted to plant that seed. We will never know the impact of us planting seeds. <laughs> How much growth can we get that? We need to be planting seeds all over the place. You know, when, when people see a, a good movie or, or a good show where they go to a new restaurant, they want to tell everybody about it. Because they're passionate about it. That's exactly how we need to be about the faith. We need to stop being so afraid and timid of talking about the faith. People have a natural desire within them for God. Just as I did when those two friends invited me to join their small People have a thirst for God. And we need to plant those seeds. Help that faith within them. The parable of mustard seed, it reminds us where our power comes from. To grow the faith, to grow the church, it comes from God. We have to implore His power. It also reminds us that we have to be planting seeds, and God will give the growth. But first, we have to be willing to plant the seed.